Hello, um, my name is Steve Grubb. Um, I, I work on common criteria, um, you know, the Red Hat uh, Security Engineering Group. Um, I've done six common criteria evaluations uh, over the years, and uh, I have uh, uh, Mark Becker here is going to uh, help present some of this. Uh, Mark, you want to? Yeah, hey everyone, uh, Mark Becker, I'm the product manager responsible for security in Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and uh, we're going to be talking as we go through. Steve's going to go in a deep dive about what common criteria is and the very specific definitions, and I'll take you through just a very quick summary of where we are today in Red Hat with well common criteria, where we're headed in the future as well. Thinking about it, some of this may be the first time I've publicly said it, so it's okay, Sean knows, that's all. Okay, so uh, this talk is intended to be sort of a common criteria 101. You know, if you don't really know much about common criteria, that's kind of um, the level of, of what this talk is aimed at. <coughs> And what we're going to go through um, is, is basically um, the, the different parts of the security target. Um, protection profile, we'll go over some of the terminology. Um, and then we'll um, uh, you know, pull it all together about you know, what an evaluation is and what it does. And then I'll hand it back over to Mark. So to, to get some sort of frame of reference, let's listen in to a conversation, a fictitious conversation with a uh, salesperson and a customer. You tried out our new XYZ OS. No, why should I? It's so secure. How secure? Very. <laughs> <laughs> prove it. Okay, what would it take to prove it? Uh, I'd like to see independent third-party review that includes a code review, testing, review of the development process, a list of security features and the threats they counter, security guidance so I can lock it down, and a vulnerability assessment so that I know that you've patched everything. <laughs> Is that all? Maybe some penetration testing because bad guys do that too. Sounds like a lot of work. Maybe so, but serious claims demand serious proof. So what is our sales guy gonna do? What's the company gonna do? Well, unbeknownst to him, uh, the customer just specified common criteria. Common criteria is an internationally agreed upon set of uh, uh, requirements uh, that facilitates comparability uh, between uh, security evaluations uh, it sets a common set of requirements uh, for functionality with a certain product type, and it requires a certain assurance measures to be applied uh, during the development and evaluation. This is sort of a, uh, a, a visual concept of, of what, what is, is happening here. And instead of owners, uh, you know, which owners would be the purchaser, uh, I would rather substitute the word developer you know, into this. And so developers impose countermeasures to reduce risk to assets. The customer owns assets they don't want uh, bad things to happen to. Um, owners you know, wish, wish to minimize risk, and uh, owners value their assets. Meanwhile, we have threat agents that give rise to threats that increase risk to assets. And the threat agents wish to abuse and or may damage those assets. So let's uh, take a look at uh, some common term, uh, acronyms and terms used in common criteria because these slides are going to have, have all of this on it. And just want to make sure that you guys are familiar with some of these terms before you see the slides. Uh, the first one is TOW, which is the target of evaluation. And what that means is it's the hardware with the software uh, installed. Protection profile. This is a set of requirements uh, for a product type. And we'll discuss this in more detail. Uh, ST is a security target, and what that is is a customization of the protection profile for a specific product. TSF is uh, the target of evaluations security functionality. SFR is a word we're going to run across a lot. 
It means the security function requirements. Uh, a couple more terms. Uh, developer, uh, the company that makes a product. Uh, scheme, that's the government agency that sets the security rules. Uh, there's, there's several schemes, you know, like NIAP is in the United States, BSI is in Germany, uh, Spain and Turkey, Italy, you know, uh, France, Canada, they all have uh, schemes also uh, that uh, set the security rules. Assurance. This is the confidence that software is free from vulnerabilities, either intentionally designed into the software or accidentally inserted. Okay, so um, when you get into uh, the, the security target uh, one of the, or the production profile, one of the introductory sections is about threats. And this is an important section to be able to uh, take a look at because this tells you what the people that wrote the production profile had in mind uh, when, they, uh, when they wrote it. Um, so you know, the definition is that a threat consists of adverse actions performed by a threat agent on an asset. Um, there's an example that I have here uh, that says uh, T, local attack, uh, T meaning threat. What this um, particular one says is that an attacker may compromise applications running on the OS. The compromised application may provide malicious uh, formatted input to the OS through a variety of channels including unprivileged <coughs> system calls and messaging via the file system. So this would be, you know, something that that they wanted to counter. This is a threat that they saw, you know, to the to the operating system. And so, you know, this is one of the, the things that they list. Another section is going to be assumptions. And this is the accepted beliefs around the operating environment that the security function will not address. Like, for example, down at the bottom, we have uh, A, proper admin. And what this basically says is that the admin of the OS is not careless, willfully negligent, or hostile. And the administrators of the OS will, within compliance of the applied enterprise security policy. So what that would mean is that all the security measures are not intended to protect against the malicious admin. Another section uh, in, the, in the beginning is the security objectives. Um, this is a, a concise and abstract statement of the intended solution to the threat. Uh, I have an example here uh, from OSPP called the protected comms. Uh, this one says that to address both passive eavesdropping and active packet modification, <coughs> network attack threats conformant OSs provide mechanisms to create trusted channels. In other words, it's an encrypted, they want you to use cryptography to um, protect the uh, communication. Okay, so once you get past this introductory section, you, you finally get to something called SFRs, which is um, the, the more concrete things that you're expected to do uh, as a developer. The SFRs are a <laughs> Our translation of the security objective into a detailed and complete level of, of abstraction, but independent from any specific solution. And the reason that, that they do it this way is so that they can say that they want a, a certain kind of protection, but Microsoft has the leeway to solve it their way. Linux vendors can solve it their way. Macintosh can solve it their way. So they, they don't specify a complete solution, but they give, they give um, something that we can all do. And, and an example, uh, from Common Criteria Part 2, um, they have a requirement here that says, when the defined number of unsuccessful authentication attempts has been, and then you, you have a selection that says met or surpassed, then the TSF shall do something. So this is not very uh, detailed. Okay, so... Um, the, the SFRs is really the meat of common criteria, and this shows all the different families of uh, security functionality that, um, that the catalog has. So common criteria part two is a huge catalog of uh, all these different security functionalities. And within these families, there's a lot more. There's a, there's a test on this later, so. <laughs> 
Yes, there's a lot more of, uh, let me see, we have a pointer here. Yeah, oh well. Oh well. Okay, so um, the, the major ones that you would run across in a um, protection profile is, is under protection of TSF and user data protection. Um, you know, like for example, access control policy. This one is um, one that would define uh, you know, permissions on files and, and being able to access things. But in any event, I just wanted to... Okay. In any event, I just wanted to show you that, um, that there's a, a lot of different kinds of, uh, of requirements uh, you know, in, in the catalog, but you don't have to know about all these things because normally you run across a protection profile uh, which has already pre-selected the ones that you, that you need to care about. Speaking of protection profile, um, a protection profile is intended to describe a type of a product. Um, it contains the threats, uh, objectives, assumptions, uh, everything that this kind of product may encounter. Uh, the people that write protection profiles uh, is generally a government that is specifying its requirements as part of the acquisition process. There's a lot of different uh, protection profiles out there. There's probably uh, 30 or 40 of them just, just under NIAP. And what I did is I just went and picked a few of them to just give you a feel for the different kinds of protection profiles that, that are out there. Uh, application software, uh, that's to address things like um, uh, a Java server or a Java servlet. Then there's operating system protection profile, which is the one that, uh, that I care about. Um, there's full disk encryption, uh, network device. Uh, there's a protection profile if you want to be a firewall. If you want to be a VPN gateway, there's one for that. If you want to be a multifunction printer, there's one for those. Mobile devices, these things go through common criteria also. Uh, USB flash drive, the one you had, that thing goes through common criteria. Uh, smart cards, VOIP, all these things uh, can go through common criteria. The security target is, is a further detailing of, of, the, of the PP. Um, and it and explains how uh, you know, this combination of software and hardware uh, meets the security objectives. Uh, in this, it talks about exact technologies like SE Linux, PAM, kernel. You know, at this point, this is, this is really where you go from the abstract to you know, this is how we're gonna solve the problem. Uh, the other thing, too, about the security target is it serves as a basis of agreement between the developer and the evaluator on the exact security properties and the exact scope of an evaluation. So in other words, um, when, when a company writes a security target, they give this to the lab, and this is what the lab tests exactly. Okay, and, and um, one, one last thing to, to talk about here is that uh, it, Yes, you know, as we saw in that example of the, um, the SFR, there are electives, you know, where somebody has to make decisions about how, how uh, this requirement is met. And I, I have an example uh, down here uh, that shows the before and after. Like, this, this section here in the middle comes straight out of the common criteria catalog, uh, which, you know, it's, it's the same requirement we saw earlier. And when a defined number of unsuccessful authentication attempts has been then selection met or surpassed, then the TSF shall do something. So it was, it was refined in the actual security target to say when the defined number of unsuccessful authentication attempts has been met, the TSF shall disable user log, logon account until it is re-enabled by the authorized administrator. So you, you see how it gives you uh, some room and then you, know, you, you tell how it's solved. Um, normally, uh, there's one step in between, and that is that the, the scheme uh, takes the, out of the catalog, and then they do some selections. In other words, this is this assignment where it says list of actions. They go ahead and populate that list with the things they would like to see you do. In other words, they kind of give you a hint on how they want to see it solved, and then you have to pick from that list. Okay, one, 
Um, one other set of requirements. Um, these are the ones that um, we normally um, don't like. And this is the assurance requirements, uh, which describe what the evaluator will do uh, to confirm that the SFR is, is met. Um, it, it also specifies things like uh, you have to use uh, Git or some kind of um, version control system. And it, has, it specifies, you know, other things like uh, training, you know, of staff and uh, locks on doors to make sure that people just can't come in and commit code. Uh, so there's a lot of things to assurity, assurance ac activities, but there's some that are specific to uh, the SFRs. And I have some examples here uh, just to show you, you know, the nature of, of what's expected. And it says, you know, the evaluator will attempt to modify all shared libraries that are used throughout the system. And, uh, you know, if if the system's designed right, you know, the files are owned by root and you can't modify anything as a, as a common user. Okay, so to, to tie all this together, um, the developer or a company uh, picks a protection profile. That protection profile is supported by a specific scheme, which, you know, means a, a nation. The scheme has accredited a number of labs that it tests periodically to verify their capabilities. The developer contracts a lab to conduct the evaluation of the security target following the assurance activities to prove that the tow counters the threats. The lab then conducts these tests and submits paperwork to the scheme. The scheme reviews the documents and if everything is good, they issue the, uh, the certificate. Otherwise, uh, they, they tell the lab that there's some problems and uh, it goes back to the developer where they may have to do more testing uh, and documentation. And, you know, ultimately, you know, a certificate is issued and um, then uh, all signatory con countries to the Mutual Recognition Treaty accept this evaluation. Okay, so how, how can developers help? For the product type that you have, you know, you, you'd want to find the, the protection profile if, if one exists. Because, uh, you know, not everything exists. Like, for example, in containers, there is no protection profile for containers at this point. Um, but if you work on firewalls, you know, there is definitely a protection profile for that. So what you would want to do is look at the SFRs and see if, if, you, if your product already meets them all or you could configure it to meet them all. If the SFR has electives, then you want to try to provide as broad a coverage as possible so that the security target writer can claim as much as possible. So in other words, in the cryptography section, they may list, uh, you know, 10 different ciphers, you know, that are acceptable. And so what you would probably want to do is to try and support all 10 of them if you can, so that you can claim all 10 of them. I mean, you, you might be able to get by on one or two, but the market probably is, you know, your competitors are probably going to support all 10. So um, that's, that, that's how you can help, is to, to read, read the PP, look at the SFR, see if you meet them. If not, fix, you know, do something to meet it and try to provide as much coverage as possible. Okay, uh, thanks Steve. So I wanna take you through just real quick in the remaining time that we have available about where we are with common criteria today. Um, Steve already kind of set this up, but if you're a developer in the room, most obvious question, eh, that's great, but why should I care? Um, there's lots of reasons to care. Uh, number one, because our customers, everybody has customers, require common criteria. It's a purchasing requirement. And given two products of equal capability, the one with common criteria certification is the one that they will buy, the one that they must buy. Especially in the US, in many situations, it's just plain mandatory. They just have to buy it. The other reason why should you care? Other people are doing it, right? Other vendors are doing it. But most importantly, as a developer, because of all of those reasons, you worked really hard on your code and you want your technology to be in the hands of people that actually want to use it. Thus, you care about common criteria. So where are we today? Uh, Red Hat's been doing common criteria for a very long time. And generally for the operating system, we have picked the general purpose operating system protection profile, GPOSPP. And we have actually evaluated RHEL 7 uh, twice against OSPP version 2.0 and OSPP 3.9 on Intel x86-64 and IBM Power architectures. Now, anyone want to tell me how old 7.1 is? It's not real new. Yeah. 
It's actually end of life, right? Um, you cannot get support from Red Hat anymore on 7.1. In practice, in the field, typically what we find is customers will use our protection, or rather our security uh, target uh, and the report that came out of evaluation as a continuation and a justification for, new, for using newer versions of the operating system. However, we're moving forward. So there's been a lot of changes in the US in particular around common criteria. And we have a new general purpose operating system protection profile version 4.2. The nice part about this evaluation process under 4.2 and NIAP is it's extremely fast. And what I mean by extremely fast, okay, we're talking common criteria definition of extremely fast now. It, we are required once we actually formally enter into certification to complete the certification within 180 days, typically 90 to 180 days. This 7.1 evaluation, I was born, I guess, when we started it. No, I'm just uh, it took two years, two years to actually go through evaluation, <laughs> right? Two years, 180 days, wow, it's like light speed, buddy. So it's a lot faster. Now, in reality, what that really means is there were significant changes to how the evaluation process is being conducted. It is much more automated and test-driven now. So the bullet line that was the lab conducts the test, gathers the reports, and then submits it, that whole process is now significantly more audited, uh, more automatable than it used to be. As a result of that, however, this is a new schema. And there are some limitations. For example, under 7.6, no one in the world, rather, under OSPP 4.2, there is no such concept as mandatory access control. You cannot test SE Linux under OSPP 4.2. It doesn't exist. There's no concept of mandatory access control. That's going to be a problem long term because we have customers that use, I don't know, containers with SE Linux, as if you were in the last time. And also, if you're into labeling like MLS environments, you need SE Linux mandatory access control. So Steve and other people are working on creating uh, enhancements to OSPP that hopefully will be accepted by NIAP and others so that we can, in the future, evaluate against mandatory access control. Good news now is actually no one in the US under OSPP can also claim mandatory access control. So 7.6, we are in the process of becoming fully in evaluation and talking about that more publicly, but this is the target. That is something that we're actively working on right now. What about moving forward? RHEL 8.0 is designed from the beginning to be uh, common criteria certifiable. I did not say that we were certifying 8.0. Because this is a major new release, we want to make sure if there's any issues, we shake it out right, uh, in the operating system and in the protection profile itself. So for example, one of the things that changed in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 is TLS 1.3. There were at least two talks on TLS 1.3 in this room today. TLS 1.3 is not covered under the OSPP 4.2 that we're using for RHEL 7.6. So there will likely be an OSPP 4.3 that will include TLS 1.3 support. So the plan is that we will target the next minor release of RHEL 8 I guess I'm not technically supposed to tell you what number that would be, but point, some number greater than zero on the end. Uh, that would be our target for common criteria for RHEL 8. And as I was mentioning earlier, we're going to be adding mandatory access control. And for example, under new OSPP 4.2, secure boot is an absolute requirement. UEFI secure boot is a requirement. IBM power systems currently don't do secure boot. They have other ways of making sure their environment is secure, but they don't do secure view. They literally cannot be evaluated under this model as of today. There are enhancements going on in the hardware side. There's maybe some things that we might be able to do in the protection profile as well. So I have my own. What's, what's next for you? So learn about common criteria. You're here today learning about it. If any of you are working on any of our layered products, OpenShift, directory products, identity management products, virtualization infrastructure. Look again, as Steve indicated, is there a protection profile that's interesting for you? If so, then let's talk, right? We have most of the common criteria experts here in this room. Um, if you're a developer involved anywhere in what we call our target of evaluation, the TO, which is basically down in the kernel, 
Uh, just be aware. What you're working on is what's being evaluated, right? So just be fully aware of that. And with that, I think we actually stopped exactly one. Oh, look at that. It flipped through to 525. Uh, we are at the end. So thank you for waiting on questions. Do you guys have any questions for us? Yes. Yeah, so um, with the common criteria, and it's really cool, but can um, Pensable, for example, inherit some of the con, uh, common criteria after abuse? That's a good question. Know, um, yeah, so it doesn't really matter what it touches or does not touch. Let's look at the line I didn't read. Evaluation only applies to the operating system itself, not their products. So by definition, no. Now, it doesn't inherit. So for example, you could not claim, well, common, well Ansible is common criteria certified because it's running on a common criteria certified version of RHEL. No, that doesn't work. That, that inheritance doesn't work. Now, what does work is something like FIPS where you're not inheriting FIPS certification for Ansible, but you can claim, hey, look, the new version of Ansible has been made to run in a mode where if RHEL is in FIPS mode, then Ansible will use nothing but FIPS validated cryptogra cryptographic routines. It's not that Ansible itself is FIPS validated or FIPS certified, none of those words apply. It's just compatible with RHEL running in FIPS mode, right? So common criteria, no, because the certification does not automatically inherit to any layered product. That's where you get into interesting conversations like our Rev product, Red Hat Virtualization. It's based on RHEL, oh, but it doesn't apply immediately, right, because it doesn't inherit upstream. Also, there's actually a virtualization protection profile. So now you're into a different user space, a different use space, you need a different protection profile. Mr. Dan. Is containers cause confusion in this world, or is it? It does cause confusion. Well, actually, uh, there's, there's nowhere to hang claims on containers in OSPP 4.2. Under OSPP 2.0, which is the old EAL style of uh, evaluations, uh, there, there were protection of the TSF uh, requirements there. And so you could hang claims there saying that uh, you know, it provides process isolation. But you, know, you come at it from that angle, um, you know, the, the, but you know, I've also been talking with NIAD about um, how we could do a uh, certification of containers. And what their initial thoughts are is that you know, it's another kind of virtualization. So what we would want to do is take a look at virtualization protection profile and start with that, throw away things that don't make sense for containers, and throw, you know, add some things back to it that are specific to containers, but you know, generally follow the virtualization protection profile and, and write a security target. And then if we are successful in, in evaluating that security target, come to NIAP and say, hey, this, this could be a protection profile that everybody has to meet. And they would consider that as a, uh, as a new baseline. You know, right now they're looking, you know, and looking to industry to figure out, you know, how, what, what to claim about security around containers. And I know Sean and I were talking just this week. Another thing you can do is there's a fairly broad protection profile called application. It's the actual name, application server, yeah. And that's it's kind of a catch-all category that we could classify a lot of things in, including OpenShift as a whole application. You might be able to get away with that. It's a little different, because it, it doesn't, treat, doesn't treat like OpenShift as a virtualization platform. There's a lot of leeway. But the short answer to your question, Dan, is yeah, it causes confusion. <laughs> ah, OK, two more questions. Let's start back here, actually. Right, so the question for the camera was basically long-term maintenance of common criteria released operating systems, right? Once you have maybe new CVEs and patches, I mean, you didn't say that, but I assume that's what you were talking about. How do you keep it up to date and how does that deal with certification or how does certification deal with those changes, right? Uh, yeah, so what's certified is exactly what we passed through the lab. We can do maintenance updates on that certification, so at certain points of time we can take an rolled up patch set, 
and ask the lab and say, look, here's everything that's changed since the last time that we certified. This is what it did or didn't do to the security target, our claims around what we certified. And typically that's a very fast kind of recertification, if you will, of, a, of an update, of a batch release, of a patch. In reality, an auditor at, say, a government agency understands, okay, you certified this, it's been 90 days, there's new patches, we get it, you have to install those patches. And auditors generally will work with you and the security target and understand what's been changed. But yeah, I don't know if you have any other. Yeah, and I was going to point out that the protection profile actually does call up for timely security updates. So they, they know that there's going to be changes to, to the code, and it's actually in the requirements for us to do that kind of thing. Um, it, it just that they also um, would, would like us to reevaluate within two years, you know, to just keep it fresh. But um, anyways, so they expect, they expect updates. Uh, and we, going forward, our plan is with 7.1, for example, you had two evaluations. Now we're doing it in 7.6 going forward without being too specific. Um, we intend to have no problem with that less than every two years rule. If I could get it down to once a year, that would be really great. Uh, Bob, you had a question? Yeah. Um, you, uh, you talked about doing, that we, we, we definitely uh, do common criteria for the OS. Profile. And we also do one for certificate systems. Yes. What other systems are common criteria with the Red Hat uh, that have been evaluated or in the process of evaluating right now? Uh, JBoss Heap goes through uh, certification con yeah, all the time, every couple of years. All, all the major releases of JBoss Heap go, go through certification. Um, other than that, I can, you know, we, we have done the virtualization extended module. Uh, we've done the advanced audit extended module in OSPP2, and that one was designed so that you don't actually do another security target or, or protection profile, but it was, it was modular. Um, but, you know, talking or looking at uh, competition, like for example, Microsoft uh, took Windows 10 through uh, the firewall, the VPN, uh, full disk encryption, and operating system. So uh, vendors do normally uh, take their products through you know, several things to cover different aspects of, of the uh, product. And other Red Hat layered products are evaluating it. They're honestly waiting with business cases. Rev has looked at it. OpenStack has looked at it. We're in active discussions around what to do with OpenShift since it's so rel based and especially moving forward, it's still very much rel based. Um, but yeah, you've, you've got the three that we can point to right now. Yes. So all code audit code review, which you mentioned in the beginning, how did it happen in the real life? Because nobody is able to review the whole code of rel, right? For obvious reasons, even kernel cannot be reviewed. Yes. yes. Okay. So for for those kind of requirements, um, you know, I, I personally review the code. <laughs> <laughs> now you know who to bribe. That's I'm why just saying. That's why I'm a busy guy. <laughs> But no, I did take a look at uh, the, the major pieces. And I'll tell Pam, I look all through that to, to verify everything and make sure everything using Pam it uses it correctly. Uh, but uh, you're right, we can't look at all of it. Uh, Red Hat depends on the package maintainers being familiar with upstream, being in bed with upstream, uh, watching bugs upstream, uh, backplitting bugs you know, as, as we see things happen. But then once they, they, you know, we get the package, you know, it runs in Fedora for a while. So we get a little bit of confidence that uh, you know the package is in good shape, you know, from running in, in uh, Fedora. So then you know it, it comes into RHEL, and and when it comes into RHEL, uh, we run it through uh, the Coverity uh, source code scan, and so you know it, it goes through it and gives us reports, you know, about all kinds of different defects that you know that it finds. But at the same time, we also uh, turn on other uh, different modules, so we get a uh, report on C, on Java, uh, JavaScript, uh, Python. Uh, there's a uh, shell uh, code checker, um, and then you get also you get reports from CPP check, uh, and then also the compiler team is working to add diagnostics uh, to the compiler. So, you know, the package maintainers has uh, more than enough information, you know, about what's going on uh, with that code, you know, so they can help find uh, some of the worst spots. Um, 
you know, then, then of course those patches go back upstream. You know, once we find things, we can give, give them back upstream to make sure that upstream agrees that you know the patch really fixes the code. Um, and so you know, we, we just completed this cycle uh, back in the summer uh, for, for Rel 8. There was a bunch, a bunch of activity around August, you know, for, for this kind of thing. Um, but you know, we, we, we it, it's generally enough that you know we can show the lab, you know, that we. We have our package maintainers embedded in upstream. Uh, they are sometimes the leader of the upstream <coughs> projects, so you know they have their hands on the code. But we, we can also show that we've run these, these scans and um, that you know we fixed a number of these things and we point to Bugzilla to show them we fixed uh, some of these things. And so that's how we can you know try to, to create a, an assurance case. We, we can't fix everything, you know, things get away. Um, but um, you know, we, we do make a big effort and it does fix a lot of bugs. We are out of time. Thank you guys. Appreciate it very much. <laughs>